All right, folks, welcome back. In the last five episodes, we helped Piotr, uh, well, free himself from the curse of Sasha's love. He had returned to Romania, Transylvania, to try to win her back. Uh, we did save her from her evil, shitty husband. And, uh, but she needs some time to think about it. So, uh, we got Piotr back to the bar, and he is sitting right there. Let's talk to our old friend. Hey, Jake. Now you've got something to tell the grandchildren. I figure I owe you my afterlife a couple of times over. Hey, you've done your share of life-saving around here. More than your share. You refer not only to the several thousand rides home he's given inebriated Kalahanistinians, but also the time he saved Tommy Jansen from a drug overdose by literally sucking the life back into him. And you'd also have to thank Mike, without whom I would not have ended up chasing you halfway around the world. And if you're going to thank Mike, then you have to thank Fast Eddie, and of course Mickey Finn saved the whole planet the night he first came in, and... Thanks, anyway. You're welcome. And you're right. I have something to tell my grandchildren. Maybe yours, too. He ought to laughs and shakes his head as if to say, It's too late for that. Then he casts his eyes into the club soda, takes a sip, and settles a little further into his seat. Alright, well let's start a new adventure here. There's our buddy Squish, the biker dude. Let's talk to Josie. Hi, Jay. You're talking about beans. It's my opinion that chocolate, you know chocolate, right? The Abroma Cacao, which translates to food of the gods. Hey, no proselytizing. Yes, I am familiar with chocolate. Doc, on the other hand, seems to feel that coffee... Oh, well, when you say it that way, I think that coffee, at least the way Mike makes it God's blessing, is easily superior to chocolate. More complex, more sophisticated, less reliant on sweeteners and vanilla and other additives, and less of them an emulsifier. Coffee is so pedestrian, and chocolate has a lot less caffeine. What do you think, Jake? Uh, they're both really, really... They're both really, really terrific flavors, okay? Sheesh. Oh, that's a good answer. How awfully decisive of you, Jake. Yeah, well, look, I can't win. And I'm used to winning all my arguments. Jake, you can afford to lose at least one. Right. Hi, Jay. You're talking about beans. It's my... Hey. Yeah. Doc. Oh, cough. If I tell you which one I really prefer, one of you is going to be pissed. That doesn't matter. Just speak your mind. Yeah, just be honest. Don't worry about losing one of us as a friend over something as trivial as this. Yeah, you've got plenty of friends. You can afford to lose at least one. Right. Well, I guess I prefer chocolate on a more sensuous level. See? This is anecdotal evidence. It doesn't prove anything. If he had said he liked coffee better, you wouldn't think so. Oh, of course I would. How did all this come up? Chelsea reaches in her pocket and unfolds a small brochure, and then she hands it to you. This is from my time, Jake. You skin the brochure. It's an ad of the brand of chocolate you've never heard of. It also outlines the process by which chocolate is manufactured from bean to bar. Yeah? Here, look at this paragraph. She snatches back the brochure and points to a particular paragraph which she shoves in your face. The world's greatest chocolate is believed to have been grown in one small area in the Brazilian rainforest. Unfortunately, this discovery was made too late to save the grove of trees later designated Theobroma cacao ultimusarum, and exists only in a couple of pods too damaged to be viable. The loss of these trees to the chocolate world can never be estimated, as they were destroyed by the Faxon Castoroga Pencil Company during its clear-cutting operations in Boa Vista. It goes on to reveal when the grove was believed to have been destroyed. When's that? Tomorrow. This tomorrow? You mean tomorrow tomorrow? That'd be the one. I think we should head right over to Fax and Castoroga headquarters in Manhattan and stop them. It's nighttime. Doesn't have to be. What do you say, Jake? Want to come along? You're a folk singer. You know how to raise your voice in protest against the pig dogs of the fascist military industrial complex. Interesting words from a cop. You with me or not? Sure, why not? Maybe we'll go down in history. All right. It's a wild goose chase, I tell you. You ready to start, or do you want to stick around for a bit? Ready when you are, JB. Great. Say your goodbyes if you want, and let's get out of here.
You step out of Callahan's and Josie follows right Ready? behind you. As I'll ever be. Follow me. She walks down Callahan's driveway and out to 25A. You walk slowly behind her, curious as to why she's not taking her cycle or having you drive your truck. Josie hails a cab and you run to join her as she climbs in. She has the driver take you to the nearest Long Island Railroad Station, where she pays for tickets for the two of you to Penn Station. As you emerge from the dank, urine-scented subway, you're surprised to see daylight. Hey, just how long were we on that train? So I rewound the clock a few hours. I thought it would be nice to give ourselves a running start. Besides, I figure we should start at the top, at Fax and Castoroga, and see if we can't just do this the easy way. Why'd we take the subway? Why not just zap us here? Or are the time police not supposed to take riders? Time we can handle. Space, we're not quite there yet. I want to go from time to time, I can do it. I want to go from place to place, I have to hoof it, just like everybody else. And here I thought you could do anything. No, I only do a few things, but I do them very, very well. And we have all kinds of regular characters out here at this point. We have a black police officer that we can beat. He's beat. Oh no, he is beat. Black man, a cop. Cocksucker with a huge belt buckle. And all kinds of little shoppers. You enter the office building and take the elevator to the 15th floor. Well, actually, you first go to the 24th floor because you got it in the wrong bank of elevators. So you had to take the elevators back down to the lobby and then up to the 15th floor. Technically, though, you didn't take the express elevators back down to the lobby because you got out on the first floor thinking it was the ground floor. It's not. So you have to take the original stairwell down one flight to the lobby. But as you discover too late, the stairwell doors are locked on the inside, and after pounding on the stairwell door for a while, you decide you have to climb up floor by floor and hope to find one of the doors unlocked. Six flights and two elevator rides later, exhausted but congratulating yourself for all the exercise you've gotten today, you emerge on the 15th floor and shuffle into the swank offices of Faxon Castrago. Hey, I'm fucking some stupid applicant sitting on the chair. Please, let me suck your cock. Yes? My name is Jake Stonebender. This is my associate. We'd like to speak to Mr. Kiss Colon. I'm sorry, Mr. Kiss Colon cannot be disturbed. You're in denial. Mr. Kiss Colon is very disturbed, and the sooner you stop enabling him, the sooner we'll be able to help him. Now let us pass. Uh huh. Mr. Kiss Colon's psychiatric team and his handler were here yesterday, and you were not among them. Nice try, Mr. Stonebender. I'm afraid Mr. Kiss Colon isn't receiving anyone from off the street today. But thank you for coming by. Oh, she's good. She's very good. Yes? Tell us about employment opportunities. I am not human resources. I am the president's personal assistant. You're George Stephanopoulos? Faxon Castoroga's president's personal assistant. Human Resources is down the hall behind you. Why are you also the receptionist? Our receptionist is on the 10th floor, as you would have known had you stopped there first. We wanted to speak directly to Mr. Kiss Colon. To ask him about employment opportunities? Yeah, I mean, damn. She ran rings around my logic. Kiss Colon? Motherfucker can kiss my yes. colon. Uh, my name is Jake Stonebender. I'm sorry, Miss... He's expecting us. He is. And the name? Bond. James Bond. I can't check Mr. Kiskolan's appointment calendar without a name.
Just tell him Mr. Carpaccio is here to discuss an overdue loan payment. Mr. Carpaccio, is it? I thought your name was Stonebender. That's my street name, honey. You go around telling people your name is Carpaccio, you make a lot of people very nervous. I can understand that. I try to stay away from raw meat myself. Well, Mr. Carpaccio, I'm afraid you'll need to go to accounts payable, 12th floor. This was a personal loan in the five-figure range. It was. Now, why would a man worth $20 million take out a tiny loan from a local thug? I'm not a thug. If you're not, you will be. I think not. Let's not play games. Then why am I here? Do you want the truth? If you think I can handle the truth. I am not going to let you in to see Mr. Kiskolan, period. Do I make myself clear? Crystal. This is playing hardball. Yes? Uh, my name is Jake Stonebender. This is my associate. We'd like to speak to Mr. Kiss Colon. I'm sorry, Mr. Kiss Colon cannot be disturbed. He's expecting us. He is. And the name? No, I don't think he's expecting the name. That's a little joke. Your name, please? Stonebender. Jake Stonebender. The secretary glances perfunctorily at the calendar behind her, not really needing to look to know you're bluffing. Stonebender. Stonebender. Funny I don't have an appointment for a stonebender. Would you care to make one? We have something open for the 20th of next month. No, I'm afraid it needs to be today. That's out of the question. Mr. Kiskolan is leaving on a business trip late this afternoon and positively can't accept any walk-in appointments. What if I told you he's about to be responsible for the extinction of a rare plant species of singular beauty and inestimable value? Every day is the day he becomes responsible for the extinction of a rare plant species. And they're all amazingly beautiful and of inestimable value. But we're talking chocolate here. Then I suggest you contact the chocolate companies and see if they care. I know I don't. I like butterscotch. I figured you for butterscotch. Now, if you'll excuse me. What if I told you it was an emergency? You're not a member of the immediate family, right? There's no good answer to that question, is there? She smiles knowingly and shakes her head. Because even if I lied to you about it, you'd know I was lying, wouldn't you? She closes her eyes and nods her head. What if I said, don't you know how it is? Oh, I know how it is. I'm as hip to the jive as any of you young people. Let me tell you something in your own language so that you understand. Sig, Mr. Kiss Colon is one fly dude. I will not sit here and permit you to diss him. And he is way too fresh for you. So kick it to the curb, my man, what it is. Get it? Got it? Good. She glowers at you, grinning superiorly and utterly convinced that she has just delivered a stunning put-down that should shake you to the core of your being. What if I told you I'm completely at a loss to continue with my life until I speak to him? The secretary rolls her eyes and flutters her eyelids in a spectacular display of impatience. Well, you'll just have to put your life on hold until the 20th. Shall I put you down, Mr... Rockefeller, was it? Stonebender, you've already put me down. No, I haven't. Does he ever come out of that office? She looks at you demurely. The elevators are right out that door and to your left. It was a simple question. He often comes out when he hears people abusing their coffee break privileges. The coffee guzzlers ignore the secretary's loud and obvious job.
can't go in there. Just watch us. It's locked. I'm going to call security. Wait, wait, wait. We just want to speak to Mr. Kiss Colon as soon as possible. He cannot see you without an appointment. Today, does he have any appointments free? If it's not today, it's too late. You're a time traveler. Why does it have to be too late? C can't you just... You know. This isn't exactly an authorized jump as it is. I can't go back and forth and back and forth. Let's get this done, okay? If he doesn't cooperate, we'll just go to Brazil and take the guerrilla tactic. Brazil? Why not? There we can always lie down in front of the bulldozers if we have to. I hadn't thought of that. Hopefully it's not going to come to that. Hopefully we can settle it here. some other things here first. cans are superior to the old-fashioned garbage containers because they let you see what you're snarfing before you snarf it. They also have the exclusive flow-through ventilation system for keeping trash fresh and perfuming the atmosphere for lots around. small talk with the pretzel man who insists on being called a pretzel person. He reveals that his products are actually princels. They can't legally be called pretzels because they've really been made out of dry, reconstituted pretzel flakes. This way they all come out looking the same and they stack easier for shipment. We attempt to buy the lone pretzel but the vendor refuses, saying this particular pretzel is his lucky pretzel. Not wanting to ruin the guy's luck, you pretend that that's not the pretzel you really wanted anyways. You give the vendor a dollar and he hands you a pretzel. You take a bite of the pretzel, it's soft, lukewarm, undersalted, and a little bit gritty. I think I've had enough. You see, you spend money on something like that, you end up regretting it. And you spoil your dinner. You've got great maternal instincts. Don't talk with your mouth full. Fuck you, bitch. Give me my half-bitten fucking pretzel. Shit Check out the bush with the bamboo bamboo pole. Shaking damp sphagnum from the base of the pole, you take it out of the pot. You can almost hear the plant making non pulse sounds. Oh, it's this fucking bitch again. And either the vents 
too high up or you're too far down. Wielding the bamboo pole like a punter, you're able to push up the little lever and open the louvers. With the vent open, the cacophony from the group on the coffee break is broadcast to all other offices with open vents, including, apparently, Sigmund Kiskola's office. Miss Hasselblad, how long has this coffee break been going on? Only about five minutes, sir. Oh, good. Then it's over. The employees properly chat, take their coffee, and shuffle back to their offices. How long, really? Coming up on ten minutes. Write them up. Fucking assholes. Fire all them fucking fags. Alright, we got old bald douchebag out here now. What? Can we kick the shit out of him? That's what I really feel like doing. Sigmund looks at you impatiently. Yes? We need to speak to you about your logging operations in Brazil. What about it? There's a grove of extremely rare trees on land that you're due to clear cut shortly. If you haven't already. And? Well, we were hoping to persuade you that these trees are worth saving. Why? You glance over at Josie. They produce cacao beans. Cacao trees are not endangered. These are? These aren't regular cacao trees. They're of an extremely rare variety. The vast majority of our cutting is domestic cedar. We do some cutting in Brazil, all of which is perfectly legal and authorized by the Brazilian government. I deal with... All we're talking about is... Let me finish. I deal with environmentalists every day, and I have made concessions to almost every such group extant. I will not now be bullied by the Chocolate Alliance. Thank you for my time. As you and Josie look incredulously, Sigmund turns to his secretary. Miss Hasselblad, these came to me by mistake. He hands some tickets to his secretary, spins on his heels, walks into his office and shuts the door forcefully. Miss Hasselblad glances at the tickets and tacks them to the bulletin board behind her. With a smug smile aimed directly at you and Josie, she returns to her work. Nice. Those are my tickets, bitch. You reach for the tickets, but the secretary grabs your hand. Excuse me. Step away from the tickets. I was just looking. Well, move along. There's nothing to see here. The office walls are covered with linen-like textured wallpaper. It's durable, strippable, and washable. A small yellow post-it has been scotch taped to Mr. Coffee, right by the Kleenex and Excedrin. We figure as long as we're violating trademarks, we might as well go the whole hog. I'll provide courtesy of Oscar Mayer. It says the same thing as every post-it taped to every coffee machine in the country. If you take the last cup of coffee, please turn off the burner to prevent scorching. Ah, prevent scorching. How about I scorch your face, bitch? Alright, anyways. We need to get rid of Miss Hasselbald. Pots is cooling down. All right, we need to warm shit up. You rifle through the goodies, and none of these office supplies are worth pilfering. You switch the burner on, which begins to heat up the coffee. And we just fucking leave it on, baby. Uh, uh, uh. Figuring that bad copy is better than not being watered at all, you pour the sludge into the soil. You set the pot back on the burner. Green skinny, nice jacket bitch. It looks 
like lava beans. Now, Jake, remember our rating. It's getting hotter. There are almost hot coffee drugs off by. The smell of overcooked coffee fills your nostrils. I'd like to buy six of the finest, freshest number two pencils in your warehouse, please. We don't sell pencils here. Don't you find that odd? This is a business office, not a retail store. However, I will be happy to give you six pencils if you please go away and leave me alone. Ooh, she's cracking. You're getting to her. Keep it going. That would be fine. Thank you. The secretary reaches into her desk and pulls out a box of pencils. Here. Oh. These are black pencils. I was looking for different colors. We don't make different colors. Here, then. You hand the box back to her, which she drops into a drawer, and she slams the drawer shut. Oh, wait a minute. I changed my mind. I'll take those pencils after all. I don't have any. But you just... I don't have any. They're right in that... I don't have any. I think you may have done it. The secretary breathes deeply and murmurs something to herself. She pauses, grimaces. Bridges her fingers and rocks back and forth, gritting her teeth and touching the tips of her fingers together compulsively. After a few moments of this, she straightens her back, clears her throat, and returns to her work. As if you've never spoken. Oops, false alarm. Good job, though. I choked, I choked. Phew! A stench of scorched coffee pot assails your senses. The burnt coffee smell becomes overpowering as the coffee pot begins to smoke. The secretary, her lips pursed tightly enough to make the cords on her neck stand out, goes over to the coffee machine and shuts off the burner. Look at this. Now I have to scrape the pot again. Flagrant disregard. Flagrant. She throws you a dirty look and walks off down the hallway with the smoking pot. No, she's not smoking pot. She's going down the hallway with the smoking pot. Maybe we should rephrase that to avoid any misunderstandings. Looking both ways to make sure the delightful secretary isn't watching, you slyly take the tickets off the court board. All right, I think we've got what we need here for now. Head on over to Brazil.
You take the application from the paper tray. Sleek, factory, fresh, Faxon, Castoroga pencil. What are you planning on doing? Getting a job here and subverting from within? Not exactly. With Josie in mind, you take a supplement application. No one important will ever see your application if you put it there. You and Josie took turns filing out the applications of fictional biographical information. You were a rail splitter in Kentucky before you became a professional philosopher, and now you want to go back into woodworking. Josie was a consultant for the Bureau of Planned Ob Obsolescence, in which she created a computer program that would do exactly what she did, thus ending their need for her. It was only years later that she realized her mistake. knock on one of the doors and slightly frantic sound calls out, NOT NOW! There must be some hanky-panky going on in there. It's hard to imagine that there's some kind of big pencil emergency going on. There's human resources. You saunter fearlessly into the human resources department and Hand both your applications to the HR manager. She checks them briefly, makes several notes on a legal pad, and initials the applications. She takes you and sits you down in front of a Polaroid, taking pictures of you and Josie. The applicant, bothered by the fact that you cut in line in front of him, leaves. The HR manager attaches the photos to the applications, hands them back to you, and directs you to wait in the lobby for the next available interview. She assures you it should be almost definitely sometime today. All right, we have photos of ourselves. And on that note, we'll see you next video. Thank you for watching.